Check. Good morning, church. Let's stand and read the scripture together. The sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I know how to comfort the weary. Morning by morning he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. The sovereign Lord has spoken to me and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the, my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting, because the Sovereign Lord helps me. I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone, determined to do his will, and I know that I will not be put to shame. He who gives me justice is near. Who will dare bring charges against me now? Where are my accusers? Let them appear. See, the Sovereign Lord is on my side. Who will declare me guilty? All my enemies will be destroyed, like old clothes that have been eaten by moths. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we remain. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church And we need your power in us
the darkness feel. Show your mighty hand, fill our streets and land. Set your church. morning and welcome. If you're visiting with us today, we'd hope that you might um, go to the breezeway and pick up one of these cards and fill it out. And you can put it in the communion basket during communion time. But we want to get to know you better. And welcome. Welcome to the Springs. Here at the Springs, we believe that we are being transformed into the image of Christ so many can find their way back to God. This is our core. Surrendering to the shaping and leading of the Holy Spirit, we become light and salt in the world. Jesus is why we gather each week to worship his name. We hope to grow through Bible study and living in community together as we learn to serve and love each other. And we go. And go simply means that we share our faith in Jesus in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in the city, and in the world. We gather, we grow, and we go. I have three quick things I wanted to talk to you about today, just this morning, some events that are coming up, and I wanted to call your attention to it. Number one is Good Friday worship service this Friday. We're going to join here in this gym at 7 o'clock for worship to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us all. So please put it on your calendar and plan to join us. Second, Easter breakfast. Next Sunday is Easter, and we're joining with Northside Christian Church to have a breakfast here in the gym at 9 o'clock. Bring a dish to share. We won't have any Bible class, and we'll just go from breakfast into worship at 1030. Number three, Wednesday nights in April. We are going to gather at the, our new location at Western and Covell every Wednesday in April. So that will start on the 4th of April. Um, and so the doors will open at, at 630. So if you want to bring a, bra a brown bag dinner, you can come and eat. We'll eat together just for those who want to do that. Then at 7 sharp, we'll start a time of worship and devotional. And that will be the first half of the hour. The back half of the hour will be like a family gathering where we talk about um, what's ha updates and mission, um, building renovation updates, also some opportunities where you can serve and lead. So come, it's an important time for us as a family, and bring your friends too. It's going to be a great time together. There's so much to be thankful for. This season is exciting. God's making a way in front of us as we transition. I hope that you're as excited as I am to see what God's going to do with us as we transition to this new location. Lastly, our scripture reading for today is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Kelly. Often the elders, when we get together, will say, uh, we don't know what we do without her. Amen. 
So this is Palm Sunday, and I guess your first clue would be the fact that we passed out a lot of palm fronds. Just hold them up high, those of you who have them. This is, uh, this is Palm Sunday. This marks uh, the event in which the crowds lined the street of Jerusalem for his triumphal entry, and um, about, as about as close as I got to a palm frond was uh, the palm fronds that we saw on the flannel board when I was a kid in, in Bible school, but uh, I'm glad we got these real ones here. And they were shouting, Hosanna. Now, what does that mean? Is something like God saves or Lord save us? And by the time we get to Jesus' time, that had become like a, a rallying cheer, as in a ceremony or greeting or like we would say yay and they were probably thinking he's our hero uh, he's gonna there's gonna be a new sheriff in town he's gonna ride in and clear clear out those rascals but really those people had no idea where all this was headed now there were some people not cheering that day and that would have been the Jew the Jewish ruling classes and also not cheering were the Romans now, this parade through the streets of Jerusalem looked to them like a dangerous uprising, and it had to be stopped. But this movement was headed to the cross. I was reminded of the cross a few years ago when I was looking at some actual Greek and Roman artifacts that a man was wanting to sell. Now, these antiques were uh, actual Roman artifacts taken from a dig in England dating from the time of the Roman occupation. Rome occupied Britain for about 350 years. One by one, he pulled the pieces out, and we were looking at them, coins, rings, pieces of armor, arrowheads, etc. As the items paraded by, I noticed a spearhead, a handmade iron nail, pair of Roman dice, and the Roman dice didn't look like our dice. They looked like replicas of knuckle bones. Don't ask me how they played the game. I don't know. And then whip spikes. Spikes that you would have seen on the cat of nine tails leather whip that they raked across Jesus' back. When I got to the spikes, it hit me. Those two leaded spiked rings are typical of what you would have seen on a Roman whip, the leather thongs sliding through the middle of the rings. At this point, I grabbed the spearhead. <laughs> Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> Hi, Leah. <laughs> the nail. It's in there somewhere. And then the dice. And put them all together on the table. I had um, Tina Clark, some of you will remember her, make me a shadow box with those four items. These are items that you would have seen used at Jesus' crucifixion. Now, the seller, being a good Baptist boy, looked at them for a moment and thought and said, oh, and then again, oh. Now, why did he say, oh? It hit him, too, at that point. He hadn't put the, two, hadn't put the things together. Because he realized then that these items like those would have come together at the cross. Now, they came from an earlier time period, <coughs> but they are actual items. As the palm branches were laid down in Jesus' path into Jerusalem, items like these met him at the cross. <coughs> Nails pierced his hands. Soldiers gambled for his clothing with dice. 
a spear pierced his side, and before he even got to the cross, they flogged him with a whip barbed with spikes like those. Hosanna, God saves. God will save. He did, he does. The cruciform life calls to us. Hosanna.
teach us, Lord, to live the cross where our Savior has ransomed us, risen as the victorious. We count the cost as we live the cross. Teach us, Lord, to serve the poor, for our possessions are only yours. Walking one mile, we walk one more. We serve you, Lord, as we serve the poor. servant God crucified He's calling us now to live the cross Teach us Lord to preach the word every year let your grace
Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear many whispering terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. This is a psalm of lament. And in a few moments, we'll actually sing a lament song uh, here. Uh, the writer of this psalm is suffering. He cries out to God in his suffering, asks for deliverance. We suffer physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and we lament that and call out to God for deliverance. Jesus suffered, and he lamented his suffering and cried out for deliverance. And we serve a Savior who came and suffered with us. Please pray with me. God, we just thank you for your mercy and your grace, for the gift of salvation through Jesus and his suffering. Please bless us as we partake of these emblems that remind us of that suffering on the cross. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please come to the table.
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see our God. The secret of the Lord is theirs, their soul is Christ's abode. The Lord who left the heavens, our life and peace to bring, to dwell in loveliness with men, their pattern and their king, still to the lonely soul. He doth himself impart, and for his dwelling and his throne chooseth the pure in heart. Lord, we thy presence see, may ours this blessing be. From the depths of my soul I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. Lord, can you hear me? Have mercy, O God. From the depths of my soul I cry out. In the midst of the sea I cry out. In the midst of the sea, I cry out. In the midst of the sea, I cry out. Save me, the water is over my head. In the midst of the sea, I cry out. In the midst of the sea, I cry out. There is a time to mourn. There is a time to weep. There is for sorrow when deep calls to deep. In, In my moments of grief I cry out. In my moments of grief I cry out. In my moments of grief I cry out. Have you forgotten me? Where are you, Lord? In my moments of grief I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. From the depths of my soul I cry out. Still I will praise you, Lord. Still I will praise you, Lord. Oh, worship the King. Shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to 
the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. Be seated. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany and the, at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They, will, they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks out on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the field. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna is in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked, ar- he looked around at everything, but since it, was, he, since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Good morning, Springs Church. Morning. Welcome to you in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. You're here. You made it. And uh, as, as Kelly was saying, as we've been saying, uh, this is the Sunday that we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And Palm Sunday is traditionally the beginning of what Christians commemorate as Passion Week. Uh, so the week where we celebrate and focus specifically on the last week of Jesus' life, his arrest, his trial, crucifixion, and culminating next Sunday in Easter Sunday. So I hope you will all be here for that. And this Friday, again, just another reminder, we've got a good Friday service happening right here at 7 p.m. We're going to be focusing in on the crucifixion through scripture, through prayer, and through a lot of songs. So I hope you will make a point to be with us this Friday. And if you haven't had a chance to be up to the new building in a while, I wanted to just show you just a little update of what's been happening up there. This is the building, I believe this was taken by Rod, uh, right around the time we purchased it, before any renovations had been done yet. And this is what it looks like as of last Thursday. So a lot of very exciting stuff happening. Walls have come down, walls have gone up. Steel beams have been booted and stages have come in. A lot of really cool stuff happening up there. Uh, So I am just getting more and more excited to move with you all. As much as I have enjoyed tabernacling here. (laughs) And as grateful as I am to Northside continually, I am really, really excited to move with you all this summer. Some really cool things happening and I'm grateful that God's given us that new space. So in honor of Palm Sunday, as you just heard, our text is Mark 1 through 11 this morning, his retelling of the triumphal entry. Let me go ahead and read this once more before we dive in. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead 
and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray. Lord, we gather here before you. And we proclaim you as our prophet, as our priest, and as our king. God, and this morning we want to proclaim you as the king of kings and the cruciform king. The one who has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And God, this morning we ask uh, for the gift of your illumination. That we might hear your words. And God, I ask for the gift of preaching. We might proclaim your gospel faithfully. God, we praise you with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And we give thanks to you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was just before noon on November 11th, November 22nd, 1963. Air Force One touched down at Love Field in Dallas, Texas. And the crowds were roaring and chanting that day as Jackie and John F. Kennedy exited the door of the plane. And you can hear the, the local Dallas TV announcer say, I can see his suntan from here as a smiling, confident JFK descends the stairs to these jubilant crowds awaiting. And it's a wonderful image. It's, it's a great image to see this beloved president and these crowds that, that have welcomed him into their city. But it's also a difficult image. It's also a difficult image specifically to see when you know the other images that are coming. It's a difficult thing to see this entrance when you know that that iconic pink dress that Jackie is wearing will soon be covered in the president's blood. It's difficult to see JFK hold his head high when you know in less than an hour his wife will be holding him in the back of that fleeing convertible. It, it's difficult to see such power and, and jubilation. Two images so close together in time, and yet so far apart in content. And Palm Sunday is also a little bit of a strange day for us, right? Because we have to hold these two very opposed images together in our brains. You know, Palm Sunday, we celebrate this triumphal entry of Jesus entering the holy city of Jerusalem, but it's hard to think about him entering the city when we know full well how he will leave it. It's hard to see Jesus come into shouts of joy and adulation when we know that he will leave amid shouts of ridicule and torment. Uh, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the back of a colt and he will leave with a cross on his own. Two images so close together in time, yet worlds apart in content. And yet one of the biggest differences, I think, between the image of President Kennedy and the image of Jesus Christ is that when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he knows exactly what's coming. Unlike President Kennedy, whose assassination marks the end of his reign, somehow the cross marks the beginning of Jesus's. The cross was not a surprise. It was not a mistake. Jesus knew full well what, what was coming, and yet the cruciform king entered anyway. But the disciples did not see it coming. 
that much we can say, uh, and we can say this not just from our text in Mark 11, but a few chapters ago in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus is talking with the disciples, take a look at Mark 8, 29 through 33. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then... He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. I like to think of this scene in kind of an updated way that that maybe Jesus and Peter are starting a business together. And they're about to pitch this startup to a, a group of wealthy possible investors. And so CEO Jesus gets up and and he says, all right, we, we've got this wonderful product. It's, it's going to be revolutionary. And I've got an incredible plan for this company. This is how we're going to get some growth. Step one, we're going to file for bankruptcy. And you can see Peter kind of just sitting there trying to keep the smile plastered on his face. You know, <laughs> okay, Jesus, that's nice. <laughs> what a jokester. That's our CEO. Okay, tell him the real plan, man. And Jesus is like, that's, that's the plan, actually, is we're, we're going to file for bankruptcy. After that, I'm going to be resigning in disgrace. Okay, Jesus, uh, let, me, let me talk to this guy in the hallway for a second. Just give us a minute here. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, you can just see Peter saying, Jesus, we can't win through loss. You know, Jesus, we can't possibly find victory in defeat, find success in failure. You know, the disciples couldn't possibly square in their minds this idea of a triumphant King Messiah and a defeated criminal dead on the cross. These two images that Palm Sunday calls us to hold together could not possibly have made sense to them. And we see it not in Mark 8 only, but also in Mark 11. Go back to verse 7 of our text this morning. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So this is clearly a a royal moment. Uh, We've talked about this before. Jesus is channeling Zechariah chapter 9. Where where Zechariah says, hey, behold, Jerusalem, rejoice. A king is coming to you. You're going to ride in humble on a donkey. And so Jesus has designed this moment to be a highly symbolic act, to say, hey, I am the Messiah. But, but notice what else creeps into this scene here, because Jesus is also saying, I'm not going to be the Messiah the way you think I am. Because take a look at verse 10. They say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Now, now what this amounts to is essentially a shout of nationalism. So so the Israelites, the disciples, were longing for this Messiah to come in and restore the nation of Israel, the the nation that was most powerful in those King David glory days. You know, when King David came in with his mighty military and and he smote Goliath and he defeated every enemy and he established this wonderful nation of Israel. And that's what they're wanting. They're saying, blessed is, is the coming kingdom 
of our ancestor David. Blessed is the one who, who brings back the glory days of this Israelite nation. That's what we want, Jesus. And Jesus says, guys, I am the king. I am going to be the Messiah. But not in the way you think. And not in the way you want. Because the irony is, is that Jesus is going to be enthroned king through violence. But it won't be violence that he does. It'll be violence done to him. Jesus is going to be enthroned as the king. But it's going to be as the cruciform king. A few weeks ago was the uh, 53rd anniversary of what's referred to as Bloody Sunday. And this was dramatized recently a little bit in the movie Selma, if you saw it. Uh, but this was the Civil Rights March on, on March 7th, 1965, from Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama. And one of the leaders and heroes of this march was John Lewis. Um, you can see him in the light coat at the front of the protesters. And, and John Lewis was a Christian man, a black man, uh, and, a, and a man committed to nonviolence uh, in, in this protest. And so what happened that day was uh, the protesters were trying to protest suppression of, of black votes, particularly in the South. And so they set out from Selma on U.S. Highway 80, and everything seemed to be going pretty well that day, and they got to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And when they got over to the other side, they saw a wall of Alabama state troopers. And they, they come up to these state troopers. You see, County Sheriff Jim Clark that morning had put out a call for all white males over the age of 21 to be deputized. And so these peaceful protesters come up to the state troopers and they begin to try and talk to them and they're immediately shut down. And in a manner of moments, the state troopers begin beating and tear gassing and shoving to the ground these peaceful protesters. And John Lewis was one of the first ones struck that day. Uh, but that, the face that really captured everyone's attention the next morning in newspapers across the world on the front page was a woman named Amelia Boynton, who was beat uh, and, and beat to the ground so awfully that she was knocked unconscious. And it was her face on the front of the paper the next day. And the very next week, President Lyndon Johnson, JFK's successor, sent the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to Congress that would eventually uh, allow blacks and minorities to vote without suppression. Now, if you were a Martian watching this scene, if you were an alien and you'd somehow gotten footage of this or, or photos or something, it would seem pretty clear to you on the surface who had won on Bloody Sunday. Everything we know about conflict, it would seem pretty obvious that, okay, the, the state troopers have clearly won this battle. They have, they have demolished them and physically conquered these peaceful protesters. It wasn't even a contest. They weren't even fighting back. Clearly, they have won. But if you were to dig a little bit deeper, there is a cruciform wisdom at play in this scene. Indeed, the cross itself tells us a more hidden truth that actually the greatest power in the world is found in powerlessness. The cross itself tells us that salvation might only come through patient, sustained suffering. The cross tells us that the greatest among you is actually the least. That the last has become first. 
that the poor in spirit are blessed with the kingdom of God. That is what we learn when we see that the cruciform king has been enthroned in lowliness. And I think this forces us as a church to ask the question here as we begin to wrap up our cruciform life series, is what does this mean for us practically? What does a cruciform public life look like for God's people? If, if our king has been enthroned not through violence that he did, but through violence done to him, what does that mean for us to live a cruciform public life under his reign? In other words, how, how does the cross call us to engage as Christians in politics? Well, well here's one thing that I think it says, and I think we see this throughout Scripture and I think we see it here this morning, is that we are not called to effectiveness, but to faithfulness. We are not called first to effectiveness, but to faithfulness. Now, we sang a hymn earlier called, Blessed Are the Pure in Heart. And I love verse 2, the way that it captures this idea. It says, The Lord who left the heavens our life and peace to bring, to dwell in lowliness with men, their pattern and their king. Jesus is the cruciform king, and therefore he is also our cruciform pattern. And so, of course, as Christians, we want to be effective. Of course, we want to affect change. We want to bring about righteousness. We want to bring about justice. We want to have an effect for Christ on our society. But we can never pursue and seek that effectiveness at the cost of our faithfulness. The cross tells us we can never pursue effectiveness at the cost of faithfulness to our cruciform king. Because the moment we seek effectiveness before we seek faithfulness, we will be tempted to be the ones who pick up the hammer and the nails rather than point to the one who was hammered and nailed to the cross. The cruciform king calls us first to faithfulness before effectiveness. And the reason that we can trust in this is because if we are going to be effective at all, it will be 100% because God brings the effect. If we're going to be effective in society, it's going to be because God brought the effect and we responded in faithfulness. And we see this in Exodus, we see this in Judges. When you think about Gideon, you know, what happened with Gideon? He had an army of 22,000 men. And what does God say? Essentially, he says, whittle this thing down to 300. You know, it doesn't take a, a brilliant strategist to see that an army of 22,000 is a whole lot more effective than an army of 300. But God didn't call Gideon to effectiveness. He called him to faithfulness. God calls us first to faithfulness in our public life. Now, how does that actually work out? How does this work out on a day-to-day, issue-to-issue, person-to-person basis? Well, that's what we get to discern together. That's not for me to answer. That's for us to discern together. But we will never discern well if we begin with the question, how can we be effective, before we ask the question, how can we be faithful to the Messiah who is enthroned on the cross? Because when the Messiah died on the cross, so died Israel's hopes of a temporal, earthly kingdom. When the Messiah died on the cross, so dies 
everything that persists in living for its own kingdom, its own sake, its own security, so that it must live for the kingdom of God. And so it is with us, church. So it is with us. Our wealth, insofar as it exists for its own sake, must be crucified so that it may live for God's kingdom. Our ambitions, insofar as they exist for their own sake, must be crucified so that they can live for the kingdom of God. Our sexual desires, insofar as they exist for their own sake, must be crucified so they can live for God's kingdom. Our political affiliation, insofar as it exists for its own sake, must be crucified so it can live for God's kingdom. Our theology, our beliefs, our faith, this church, insofar as they exist for their own sake, must be crucified so that they can live for the kingdom of God. Jesus is calling us to submit everything to his cruciform reign. And so what in our lives, what ambition, what sin, what affiliation persists in living for its own sake? Church, everything we have must be laid at the foot of the cross because that is where we find God's wisdom God's love, God's eternal life, and we see it all in the cruciform king. That's a power we can trust in. That's a power that has gone to the boundaries of power and found that it's actually located in powerlessness. Church, let's submit everything to his reign and let's begin by standing and praising him this morning together. Teach us, Lord, to live the cross. You, our Savior, has ransomed us. Risen as the victorious, we count the cost as we live the cross. Live the cross. morning church. I hope to see you on Good Friday this week at 7 p.m. Uh, our benediction this morning is, may you go this week submitting to the gracious reign of the cruciform king. Go in peace, church. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come and pray